Well, good morning and a really warm welcome to you all this morning, um, especially if you're visiting this morning. I'm quickly scanning to see if there are any visitors, but, or if you're joining us on YouTube, you're very welcome. So, just a couple of notices, not many. First of all, last night we had our first film night of the year. You missed it. <laughs> It was Chocolat, the film called Chocolat, and we ate chocolate while we watched it. But because we showed restraint, there is a little bit of chocolate left that you can enjoy this morning. Uh, we haven't got a date for our next film night, but we will announce that um, as soon as we can. Uh, we had a really good time, those of us were there. Very enjoyable. Next Sunday, the clocks go forward. If you forget, you will be in time for coffee, but you will miss the service. So um, do remember that next week. Uh, this week, the children are staying in church, but the following two weeks, we will be going out to our groups all being well. So um, we'll look forward to doing that, and I'll explain your activities in a few minutes' time. Now, any other notices that I've forgotten? Nobody's waving at me. Right, any birthdays happened this week? Anybody had a birthday? And I've now realised I've forgotten your name. I'm so sorry. Renata. What's your, Renata. Renata, I knew it began with R. I was thinking it was Roberta, and I thought, no, that's not right. Renata, happy birthday. Would you be okay if we prayed for you and then sang happy birthday for you? Yeah, any other birthdays? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's very impolite to say a lady's age, is it not? <laughs> Let's pray for you. Lord God, we praise and thank you for that Renata is here with us this morning, and we, we pray for her, especially at this time of her birthday, and that you will have a special blessing for her. And we just rejoice that we are family together. Amen. Okay, no music group this morning, so it's unaccompanied. Happy birthday. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Renata. Happy birthday to you. Fair enough. No one's going to argue with you. <laughs> Let's just pause now and, and pray as we begin our service. Lord God, we praise and thank you for the beauty of this morning. We praise and thank you for your love. And we praise and thank you for the joy of joining together here to worship you. Pray that you will well, we know you are with us in the midst of all we do. We pray we may recognize you here and hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we're going to begin by singing two songs, which one will flow automatically into the next one, if the technology works. And it's the power of your love followed by my Jesus, my Savior. So let's stand together and sing.
Young people, if you've not discovered your activities already, I've got a couple for you. Now this morning, we've got, it was a bit of a Bible that was actually quite difficult to prepare a children's activity for. So I looked at the little bit before it, because it leads in, and it's the story of the man, the crippled man sitting by the pool, and Jesus heals him. And that's kind of the introduction to, I think, what Ian will be sharing with us later. So you will have the wherewithal to make the man, and he's very sick on his bed, and Jesus tells him to get up and pick up his mat, and he's healed. So there he is healed, holding his mat. There he is lying on the ground. So that's one activity for you to make. The other one, it, Jesus then goes on to speak about how he, what he does, he does because he has the authority from his Father, who is God. So I was thinking about Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, all being one but all being different. So I made, or I found, a pyramid that you can make and colour in Jesus, Spirit and Father, all being God together. So that's two, and then there's also some colouring for you to do. So hopefully you've all got enough. If not, there's probably other bits on other tables, so have a look around. Now, it, our next song that we're going to sing is a Doug Hawley song. And if any of you are familiar with Doug Hawley songs, they often have actions. Now, I haven't learned the actions, so I'm not going to teach the actions this week. But they're sign language actions, and I thought maybe we could learn them for another time. 
It's quite a simple song, it's just a verse. But it's based on a psalm, and it's one of the psalms that's... There are morning psalms, and there are or some morning psalms and some evening psalms. And this is actually an evening psalm that it's based on. And how do any of you here, not just children, but probably including children, have trouble sleeping at all, ever? <laughs> yeah. There's quite a lot of us, and it's not just children. And sometimes it's because we're worrying about things. Sometimes it's just because our brains are going round and round. Maybe sometimes we've had too much coffee. Could be, lot, maybe not for the children. Sometimes when I can't sleep, I read a book. Sometimes I listen to music. Sometimes I think of psalms in my head, the ones that I've known, which isn't many. Um, and this song, actually, would be a really good one to learn and think through in your head if you can't sleep, because it talks about God being our shield and our protector, and that when we lie down and go to sleep, he's watching over us. So it's a good one to learn and maybe think of if you're having trouble sleeping any time. Now, if any of you learn this nod off while we're learning it, don't worry, I'll wake you up at the end. <laughs> so you have permission to, to have a quick snooze if that's what you need. It's called Wonderful Lord. In the middle of it, there's an instrumental interlude. So it's not finished. <laughs> Just listen and reflect on the words, and then the song repeats itself. We've had someone go off already. <laughs> Wonderful Lord.
No, nobody's snoring. And Ashley is now going to lead us in prayer. Okay, let's pray. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Father God, we confess that sometimes it's hard to be still and remember that you are our sovereign God, that you are our refuge and strength, that Jesus, because of your sacrifice for the whole world, you are the hope of the nations. And Holy Spirit, that you are an ever-present help in times of trouble. And it is with this assurance we bring our prayers to you this morning. Psalm 31 verse 21 says, Praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for the people affected, for the frightened children, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have had to leave their homes, for those who do not want to or are unable to leave their homes, for men fearing conscriptions, for women taking responsibility for a family on the move, for everyone in fear of bombardment. We pray that corridors for evacuation and humanitarian aid will remain open and provide safe passage. We pray for those with family and close friends in Russia. We pray you will show Ukrainians, wherever they are, the wonders of your love. We pray that you will strengthen leaders and governments who seek after justice and reconciliation in the face of complex competing demands. We pray for peace. When we see the story of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and Anusha Shuri, we are grateful that at a time when families are being torn apart, there is the prospect of being reunited, which brings us comfort and reassurance. Hebrews 9 verse 16 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We pray for your church whether that is in Ukraine or Russia or in neighbouring countries or here in the UK. Help us to be salt and light, loving, caring, spreading the words of hope that anchor people's souls in the storms of life. We thank you for the generosity and compassion shown by the churches and non-Christian agencies alike to Ukrainian refugees by Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Moldova, Hungary. Countries with less resources than ours but opening their hearts and homes an incredible demonstration of solidarity. We lift Luke and Wes to you who have joined the humanitarian effort this week in Romania and Moldova with Luke's charity, Chrysalis. We pray for your protection on them but also that they will be a firm and secure sign of hope to everyone they encounter and help. We pray too, Holy Spirit, that you will surround Whitney and Elaine at this time as they care for their families while Luke and Wes are away. We pray for our own country in its globalised context. We are aware that so much is interconnected and that events in one place can impact us all whether that is the cost of oil and gas, the price of wheat, or increases in inflation and interest rates. We pray for those for whom the pending cost of living squeeze is the prospect of a choice between heating or eating. We pray for those who have lost their jobs this week. We pray for the Chancellor and his advisers that you will inspire our government to reduce the financial burden on the poorest and the most vulnerable in our land. And we pray for us as part of the body of Christ in devises. Thessalonians 2 verse 8 says, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. 
We thank you for the news of Denise's recovery from her operation and look forward to when she's back with us. We are aware too that the pandemic still overshadows and continues to infect members of our fellowship and wider community. Lord God, please heal those who are unwell, comfort those with anxiety, and strengthen those caring for all who are suffering. And now in a moment of quietness, please bring to the Father the names of those on your heart who need healing of mind, body, or spirit. As we think in these weeks about mission, we pray that you will open our spiritual eyes to see what the Father is doing and reveal to us the part that we can play in your mission, Father God. We pray that in sharing our lives with others, you will help us build friendships and trusting relationships, that you will help us be your gospel in everything we do and sometimes even in what we say. We finish with a prayer for this, the third Sunday in Lent. Faithful God of love, we gather these needs of ourselves and others and offer them to you in faith and love, seeking to be strengthened to meet them. Shape us and transform us by your grace that we may grow in wisdom and in confidence, never faltering until we have done all that you desire to bring your realm of shalom to fulfilment. Amen. We're going to sing again before we have our reading and message. Um, The songs I've chosen this morning are really looking at who Jesus is and our response. And we are created for worship to bring glory to God. And the next song is Jesus, you are worthy. He is worthy of everything. Um, And our praise is just a very small, all that we can do. So let's worship our wonderful Lord. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died and won to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain to receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a chosen child.
So the reading from the Bible today is, can be found on page 1069 of the, the Church Bibles, if you've got them to hand, um, and is, is continuing on from the, the story that Muriel has already outlined, where Jesus heals the, uh, the invalided chap, and where this, because this is done on the Sabbath, and because Jesus uh, talks about God being his Father, really upsets the, the Pharisees, and here we go. It's quite a long chunk, so it's all good stuff. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at work on this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he's pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honour the son, just as they honour the father. He who does not honour the son does not honour the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favour, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. But I have testimony weighter than that of John. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you will possess eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. I'm now going to pray for Ian before he comes to give us the word today. Holy Father God, thank you for Ian. Thank you for everything he does in the church for us. So many things in so many ways. And thank you now that he's put aside time this week to spend time with you and to hear what you'd have him say to us. So Lord God, we pray you bless Ian's message to us now and pray you bless us as we listen to what Ian has to say. In the name of Christ, amen.
Good morning. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been thinking about mission. Not the kind of mission where we pack a football stadium uh, full of potential followers and fire them up with lights and music and tick them off as job done. In our society, that's not something, it's not an approach that's working as well as perhaps it did in the past. And not the kind of mission where we travel to a remote jungle location to seek out people who haven't yet learned about Jesus. For the majority of us, that's not an option either. Although it, it may be a calling for some of us. What we've been talking about is the kind of mission that every one of us can be involved with. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, how old you are. Each and every one of us here this morning can be instrumental in bringing Jesus into the lives of those that haven't yet found him. And the great news is you don't have to travel halfway around the globe. We have a huge mission field right here, here in the UK, in Wiltshire, in Devizes. We have opportunities every day to share Jesus with those around us. But we need to be careful how we share. If you throw too much information at someone, too much detail in one go, they will walk away. A little while ago, I needed to buy a new toothbrush. My, my existing toothbrush was on the way out, so I dropped into the supermarket to get a new one and was confronted with six shelves of different teeth cleaning options. Uh, different colours, sizes, makes, prices, all with text proclaiming that this brush would make my teeth cleaner than any other brush and was recommended by dentists everywhere. I spent, uh, I spent a minute or two in bewilderment looking at all the options. And then I walked away without buying anything. You know, perhaps my old toothbrush was okay. Perhaps it would last a little bit longer. We need to be careful about not overwhelming those we meet with good news of Jesus which is why we've been looking at the five thresholds of conversion. Not a rigid system or program to follow, but a set of principles that will help us as we naturally want to share our faith with those around us, but in a way that won't scare people and in a way that's genuine and sincere. We also need to remember that we can only sow the seed we can share our faith, prepare the ground, plant the seed, do all we can to help that seed grow. But whether that seed germinates, whether our friends come to know Jesus, that's not down to us. We can leave that to God. So this in our third week, um, we're halfway through the series. Our first week looked at trust, how only after being trusted and having that genuine friendship will we be taken seriously and listened to. And trust and friendship can't be faked. And being a trusted friend is a privilege in itself. <coughs> then last week we looked at curiosity. How our friendship and how we live our lives differently and perhaps our conversations might spark a curiosity that will lead those around us to want to know more about our Christian faith. And this week, we're looking at openness. How our friends must be open to change, change in their lives, willing to accept that a change is necessary before they're able to seek and discover Jesus as their saviour. Our friends may trust us, and they might be curious about our faith in Jesus. They might even be 
asking questions or launching into arguments with us about our faith. But unless they're open to having their lives changed, open to seeing the world from a, from a whole new perspective, they have a huge obstacle in their path. Only after accepting a need for change can they begin to actively seek God. As we look at the five thresholds, I think this is actually the most difficult to overcome. It's difficult for the person we're sharing with, and it can be really difficult for us to share. As Jesus followers, we take so much for granted we forget that being open to change, to a new way of looking at the world, to a new way of living, is a big deal. We're suddenly looking at a world which is bigger than us and our individualistic lives. A world where we submit ourselves, ourselves to a higher authority. And for many people today, that's unthinkable. If someone opens themselves to this kind of change, then it's going to affect how they live. It's going to change what they do, how they behave, and how they're seen by their own friends and family. And it's a huge and difficult step to take. So how do we help our friends take the next step and overcome the threshold of opening themselves up for change? People tend to have preconceived ideas about our faith, which can sometimes be very negative. If you've never stepped into a church on a Sunday morning, then your opinion may have come from television soap or drama. And you may have noticed that uh, bad news is always reported more enthusiastically than good news, isn't it? So a Christian who commits any kind of misdemeanour or crime will tend to hit the headlines far more than a Christian that's helping out in the local community. The good news, however, and it's encouraging, is that according to a survey by the Evangel Evangelical Alliance, the vast majority of people that personally know a Christian friend or family member Describe the Christians they know using words like friendly, that's 65%, caring, 51%, good-humoured, 48%, generous, encouraging and hopeful. We can sometimes be afraid to talk about our faith because of what people may think of us and how we'll be thought of. The truth is, most people are positive about Christianity and if your friend is curious about your faith, then it's great that you can have discussions about how Jesus has made a difference in your life personally. But for those that are not yet open to change and not yet seeking God, it's likely that they're looking for reasons not to accept God in their lives, which, like my decision to walk away from buying a buying a new toothbrush is actually an easier option. They're probably going to be cynical and it can be easy to get sidetracked into theological arguments. We can get drawn into the detail of Christian failings and let's be honest, there are quite a lot of those when we actually need to be talking about the bigger picture. Being a follower of Jesus can be complicated. And we need to keep it simple and sometimes point out the uncomfortable truths. In the reading we heard from Cameron um, earlier, which I apologise, is quite a long reading and, and you could argue in places a little bit dull because it's, it's quite kind of technical, it's not, not exciting things going on. Um, but Jesus was faced with some confused Jews who weren't open to, open to change. And like all Bible passages, you need to put this reading into context. And it's really worth reading the whole chapter, the whole of chapter 5 in one sitting, just to see how the whole story unfolds. 
If we turn back a few pages to the beginning of John 5, Jesus has healed a cripple uh, by the pool in Bethsaida. The crippled man doesn't know who Jesus is, but follows his command to pick up his bed and walk. Something he gets into trouble for when spotted by the Judeans in the temple. This all took place on the Sabbath, and as we know, there were strict rules about what you could and you couldn't do. Carrying your mattress was definitely not allowed. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the Judean leaders were far more interested in the carrying of the mattress than the healing of a man that had been crippled for nearly 40 years. That is, until they heard who had healed him. When they discovered that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, they went straight off to confront him. And, um, and the part of the conversation that we've heard this morning are in these verses. This is the, the start of the major opposition to Jesus. Because of what, when, when confronted, he not only admitted healing on the Sabbath, but he also spoke of God as his father. Two things that aren't going to go down well with the Judean leadership. The other interesting point is Jesus doesn't go into deep theological argument here. He asks the religious leaders to examine their own beliefs, their own lives, and their own understanding of the scripture. And explains how what they have read in the scriptures is completely consistent and in Indeed, it points directly at Jesus as the Messiah. In 519, Jesus emphasises the importance of what he's saying. He says, I tell you the truth. This is just Jesus saying, listen to this, it's really important. And he begins in verses 19 to 29 by explaining the Jewish claim that he was making himself equal to God. Jesus used the, ter- the, the title son as well as referring to God as his father. Today, it's, it's often the case that a son or daughter follows the profession of their father. And that was also the case in the New Testament times. Those listening would have understood the concept of a son being apprenticed to their father and carrying on the work that the father had started. Jesus gives four reasons to support support his claim. First off, he does what the Father does. There are no inconsistencies between the Father and the Son. They are one. Secondly, the Father shares his knowledge and plans with the Son. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. There is a common knowledge and goals. The son has the same powers over life that the father has. Jesus has the power to raise the dead, just as God has that power. And we see this um, all the more clearly in chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And we see this fully revealed when Jesus himself goes through death on the cross and resurrection. And finally, Father has given the Son authority over judgment. Most Jews already believed that God would raise the dead, with Daniel 12 uh, verse 2 being the supporting text. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. This was the judgment that the Jews were looking forward to and Jesus was pointing out that he was the fulfilment of those scriptures and in hearing and in believing they would, when judgment came, pass from death to life. Having explained what authority he has, we move on to verse 31 where we begin to get um, a slightly legal feel as he teases out the Jewish leaders their own thoughts and beliefs so that they can begin to understand 
that by their own beliefs they must conclude that he is the Messiah. Jesus says, don't take my word for it. Look at your own evidence. Don't accept my word. The Jewish leaders accepted John the Baptist as a prophet, but refused to look at where he pointed or more accurately, who he pointed at. John the Baptist's witness was important, but he wasn't the saviour. Jesus is the only route to everlasting life. Despite the testimony of John the Baptist, Jesus said there are more important proofs of who he is. The works that he is doing the miracles he's performing, all in the name and in conjunction with the Father. John's Gospel only mentions three signs so far, but it's implied that there were many more. When John sums up the Gospel at the end of chapter 21, he says of Jesus' miracles that if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So Jesus was saying to the Jewish leaders, look at what you're witnessing. Look at what I'm doing through my father. I'm completely in alignment with what my father is doing. God is my witness, and you yourselves are my witness to my being the Messiah. Finally, in verse 39... Jesus gives them both barrels when he talks about their knowledge of Scripture, which is not only a blunt wake-up call for them, but also a warning for us. These Jewish leaders, they knew the Scriptures. They studied the Torah diligently. When we look at the various religious groups, um, all of those at the time, it's easy to conclude that they competed in their knowledge of scripture for prestige and honour. They weaponised scripture to put others down and feel superior themselves. This is what Paul, who'd been um, an extreme Pharisee, spoke about in Galatians. They knew, they knew the scripture intellectually, but they didn't allow that same scripture to bring them to God and to see how it points to Jesus. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. As an aside here, I want to point out, reading the scripture is a good way to learn, gain wisdom and get closer to God. As Jesus followers, we should study the Bible, but we we need to be careful that we don't get wrapped up in knowing all about Jesus intellectually without actually knowing him as our saviour. And this is what the Jewish leaders were doing. They knew all about the Jewish hope for a Messiah, but they missed the important part They missed seeing the Messiah himself. When Jesus said they would be condemned by Moses Moses himself, it would have been a shock to the Jewish leadership. Something they wouldn't want to hear and may well ignore, but certainly a wake-up call. Something that would be an uncomfortable truth for those Jewish leaders. And this brings us round, back round to our friends who need to be open to changing their lives before they can seek God. We need to look at our friends' lives and ask ourselves how we can prompt them to look at their life within God's story, gently challenging them, just as Jesus challenged those he spoke to, not in a judgmental way, but by coming alongside them with encouragement and clarity. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I'm completely wrong. I've gone down a track or taken a point of view 
that in my tiredness or sometimes anger has led me to a point of being completely unreasonable and blinkered in my attitude. Someone coming to me and aggressively arguing would just put my back up and make the defence of my viewpoint even stronger. How dare they tell me how I should behave or what I should think? And it takes someone I trust to come alongside me, and that's often my wife, <laughs> and point out gently, lovingly, in a non-judgmental way, that perhaps I've been unreasonable, perhaps I've overreacted, perhaps I haven't thought things through, to challenge me. And I may not react immediately, but I'll go away and I'll think about how I've been challenged and will slowly come to realise that I'm wrong. As Jesus followers, we need those around us we trust to gently challenge us in our lives. A support group, if you like, but equally, we need to be there for our friends to challenge and support them as they're asking questions and being curious about Jesus. We live in a, in a world of broken people who are looking for answers or often escape from a world that has no meaning for them. There's an emptiness in the lives of many that's being filled with destructive behaviours. As trusted friends, we need to point out and challenge those behaviours. Everyone is different and has a different approach that will suit them, but if we want to bring our friends along the path of, to Jesus, we need to challenge them towards openness, and though it might feel a little uncomfortable for us, if done prayerfully and patiently, it will be a natural progression as we share our faith. As we bring our friends to an openness to seek change in their lives, let's remember to pray for them and to be patient with them, as well as to challenge them. <coughs> let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us the courage and opportunities to reach out to those we know in the knowledge that we can put our trust in you. Give us the right words at the right time and give us patience to know that those that don't yet know you need time to think things through. And that may be weeks and it may be years, but however long it is, we pray that we will be there for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's, let's stand to sing our final song this morning, Ancient of Days. Kingdoms rise and fall, let it stay.
Let's just pray a moment as we finish our service. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You are the Ancient of Days. Time is in your hands. And we do long for that time when we will stand face to face in your presence. What wonderful words, Lord, as we bring to an end this time together. And we just pray that that thought will go with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just say the blessing to and from each other. And if you do, I haven't got the words on the screen. If you don't know it, just give a blessing to the person sitting next to you. Use your own words. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Do so join us for tea and coffee if you're able. Yeah.